Welcome to the Women in the Arena podcast, a platform dedicated to honoring America's women veterans who dare greatly in all aspects of life. I'm your host, Sarah Scully. At Women in the Arena, we harness the power of storytelling to illuminate the human experience. Through authentic narratives, we honor the resilience, authenticity, and leadership of women who have served our country. Our name, Women in the Arena, pays homage to Theodore Roosevelt's legendary speech, The Man in the Arena, recognizing the remarkable contributions of women in traditionally male-dominated domains. Welcome to this episode of the Women in the Arena podcast. We are thrilled to have Major Jackie Barnum with us, a multifaceted leader in the United States Marine Corps, philanthropist, mentor, and advocate. Many recognize Jackie from her influential presence on Instagram, where she harnesses the power of social media to connect service members and promote mentorship through her nonprofit organization, Mentors in Service. Despite her very busy schedule, Jackie has taken the time to contribute to season one of our podcast, and we're excited to share her inspiring story with our listeners. Join us as we celebrate one of our incredible trailblazers making a difference every day. Stay tuned. Jackie, welcome to the Women in the Arena podcast. We're so excited that you're here for season one. Um, I have to uh, just express my gratitude that you agreed to come on because I know that I kind of ghost emailed you on LinkedIn was like, hey, I have this project I'm doing. Um, I really want you to be a part of it. And you gladly agreed and fit us into a super busy schedule while you're up here in the D.C. area. So thank you so much for being here. I think I first was like, how did you get this email? Yeah. Because <laughs> it went to my personal <laughs> Gmail. And I was like, wait a minute. Yeah. Then- <laughs> so I found like a new level of LinkedIn stalking. And I think I also maybe taught you a little bit about privacy settings. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, OK, I need to change that ASAP. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> but well, thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Um, I have so much I want to talk about. But let's first start with your story and uh, super open-ended, but just your childhood, your background, how you ended up at the Naval Academy. Tell us about the beginnings of you. Yeah. So I am from a very just patriotic family in general. Um, My dad's dad was a cop for NYPD for 20 years. Um, my mom's dad was in the Navy and then worked for, like, worked at the Pentagon. And they just, like, Coming down to me, just very patriotic, um, very proud, um, and just raised me that way. And then um, 9-11, when I, you know, I was 11, 10, 11 years old in fourth grade, and my uncle was killed in the North Tower of the World Trade Center. And, I mean, that's like a very impressionable age. So I remember just like that day and those days afterwards and just feeling like, you know, we just didn't hear, didn't hear, didn't hear. And like, it was like a slow motion of three days. And I just remember those days very clearly. And like, from that moment, I just was like, I need to serve. And like, I didn't even know what that really meant. But you know, someone hurt my family and hurt this country. And I took it obviously very personally. And so after that point, I just was like, I feel this need to serve. And uh, a few years later, Somehow, I don't remember this. My mom remembers this part where somehow I heard about the Naval Academy and she, I was like online, like after my like timed Sims time, you know, like I was like online, like looking up the Naval Academy and I was there, we were doing a trip to DC and I was like, I want to visit this place. So my parents were like Naval Academy because my parents weren't military. So they just were like Naval Academy. Oh, that's cool. So we visited, I fell in love with it. Um, and then high school rolled around and I, you know, just like a typical high schooler, we start doubting ourselves and it turned into like, I just was like, no way I'll get in, you know, like, and so I kind of pushed that aside. And then General Angela Salinas, who was the first, um, Latina general in the Marine Corps, who was a graduate of my high school, which is so random because my high school is so small. Um, she came and spoke and I just don't remember a word she said but I just remember like her presence and her Mm -hmm. like the way she spoke and the way she stood I turned to my best friend and I was like that's what I want to be like that's what I want to do I was like a senior in high school at that point so I was like oh I guess we're gonna look at the Naval Academy again and so I was like going through that application and kind of simultaneously because I also have like an artistic side 
like, as you can probably see through like my Instagram stuff, like I do have a creative side of my brain. Um, so I was also interested in graphic design. So I was applying to graphic design colleges <laughs> or programs for college. And I remember having like, I got into ASU, their graphic design program and like the Naval Academy, <laughs> which are like, couldn't be more opposite of schools. And I vividly remember like something telling me or someone saying to me, if you don't go to the Naval Academy, you're making the wrong decision. And I just was like, okay, I've never had a gut feeling before about anything, but I'm going to listen to this. And then after that point, it just was like, the rest was history. Like I never at any point really doubted my decision. I just was like, this is what I'm going for. I'm putting in 100% effort, um, kind of in the back of my mind, knowing the Marine Corps was something that was you know, of interest to me because it just was the hardest thing. And that's kind of like in my personality, like even throughout my childhood, I was the kid that was involved in every sport, like every activity through high school. I was like the class president and, you know, just that overachiever. So of course, like for my personality, it makes sense that like the Marine Corps is what I wanted out of college or out of the academy. So that's kind of how I got there in my, in my story on that. Amazing. So you arrived to the Naval Academy, and I just have to ask, do you have any funny stories from that first year of being there? Because I know it's a huge change, and everybody kind of walks away from their first entry into their military journey with some laughs. So, Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know if I just, like, didn't have any mentorship before I went. Like, I did not know what I was getting myself into, which probably was a good thing for me. Because if I knew what was about to be happening to me, I probably would have been like, oh, no, no, like getting yelled at. What? Like, I just, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. But I remember the first day, like I day is what they call induction day. And people, I just maybe was, didn't, was not given good, good enough guidance. But I remember getting, like checking in. I'm so nervous, of course. Um and one of the detailers, a scary first class, like looking back now, they're like kids, you know, yeah. but like when you're 17 years old, they're so scary and old. And one of them was like, and of course, the women are like even more scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she's like, what's your name? And I was like, Jackie. And she's like, what? Like got so mad that I said my first name because of course, like, you know, there's no first names anymore. She's like, are we friends? Do we go shopping together? Like I just remember <laughs> getting like so in trouble within my first two seconds of being in that building. And then the rest of the four years, I feel like I was just in like fight or flight. Like I don't even have, <laughs> I'm sure I have other stories, but that is the first one that comes to my mind where I'm just like, what was I thinking? Like, why did I say Jackie? Like, yeah panic move yeah I have some some similar stories so that's awesome so um moving through the service academy what did you end up doing once you commissioned so I commissioned as a second lieutenant and I again another like maybe decision that I regret or not but I just was like wanted to get there like I wanted to get to the fleet as soon as possible so there's this thing called like basket leave and basically, it was like a free 30 days of leave that people were given. And I was like, I don't want that. I want to go to TBS right now. And looking back, I'm like, oh, dang, I'll never get those 30 days ever again. <laughs> but I mean, for me, I just was like so excited to like have commissioned and just like get going. Like for me, if I, you know, like objects and rest stay in rest. So if mm -hmm. I was about to like take those days off, it wasn't going to like benefit me. And I was just wanting to do as well as possible at the basic school. So I went to the basic school right away. I think I checked in in like July, which is a super fun time to check into Quantico, Virginia. <laughs> um, and then I was picked to be a logistics officer, which was my second choice. So I was like, so devastated. Looking back, like it worked out so well, but it's mm -hmm. like so funny. Like I wasn't used to this whole like putting in your preferences and mm -hmm. then like someone else decides for you. Like my whole life, it was like, if I wanted something, I would like usually get that thing. Mm -hmm. So not only was I like picked to be a logistics officer and then I was also sent to Okinawa. That was where my first set of orders were. So that was my last choice. So I remember being like shocked and I was like, what? Like, how could this be? Like, we have four choices, West Coast, East Coast, um, like Hawaii and Oki or whatever. And yeah, so 
But again, looking back, it all worked out so well. And I honestly, like, at this point recommend people going to Japan or overseas if they can, especially for your first duty station, because I didn't have a family to be moving or worrying about. I was able to save so much money, like, looking back, but I, like, went with such a bad attitude, and then (laughs) I was able to turn around. And I had a passport, which was so great. Like, we'll never travel those places probably ever again, because it was so easy to over there but yeah logistics and then right to uh, logistics school in North Carolina and then right to Japan awesome and then what was it like living abroad and then getting into a leadership role like being abroad all of that all at once yeah so I think that's why it worked out well because I as a I think how old was I I must have been 22 and I was immediately put in charge of um like a motor transport platoon. Mm -hmm. So you're like a 22-year-old in charge of 40 people right away. And I had this cool job where there's like this equipment allowance pool that's in the Philippines. It's like kind of, you know how we like gear staged all over the world Mm -hmm. for like contingencies or whatever. So there's gear in the Philippines in Manila. And we don't have like a permanent presence there. So we basically... I was in charge of this gear and I had to go back and forth between the Philippines every like three weeks for a year. So I went to the Philippines like literally 12 times. So the I literally, the I learned the most that I've ever learned in the last 10 years of being in the Marine Corps, like in those two years, because you're overseas. So you're on the total, like opposite time zone of people here. So you don't really have like Unless it's like lunchtime, that was like my time to call my family. But other than that, like you're working. The op tempo is so high over there. There's so many exercises, so many opportunities to be like, and as logistics officer, everyone needs you at something. So I had so many chances to be like, oh, I can go, I can go, I can go. So I went and like, I just was totally immersed and I just dove into my job and learned so much during that time. So it was really good from that aspect. And then, yeah, being in charge of people like right away. So that's what I always recommend to um, lieutenants that are going through TBS when they're not sure what MOS. It's like, well, what do you want out of the Marine Corps? Like, do you want, like for pilots, like you have to be okay with not having Marines for a long time. And that's okay. And like your aircraft is like what you love most. And that's fits for some people. But for me, I wanted to like lead people right away. So logistics and then, you know, being a platoon commander really like fit that perfectly for me. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So like you touched upon earlier, um, you feel like you have some dualities in your strengths, a creative side, and then also your desire to serve and be a leader in the military. So talk to us about your creative side and just some of the things that you're interested in outside of work in your day-to-day job. It's so funny looking back at like before Instagram was like a thing, like I still loved making videos. I found this, <laughs> I think I posted it because it's just so funny to me. Like no one else cares except people like in my company at the Naval Academy. But like as a plebe, I thought it would be like hilarious to make a music video of all the plebes to like Avril Lavigne, <laughs> Complicated, that song. Oh my gosh, best song and ever. And <laughs> I don't know, I should have been like studying physics. I, like why was, why did I do that? I don't know, but I was like, <laughs> editing it I was like using my like iMovie or whatever I think I was like so good at it but like I just loved doing like creating spirit like we have these things called spirit spots in Able Academy like before a big army navy game or whatever we like make these stupid little videos and I was always like wanting to make those and um I just have like grown up painting and doing all that kind of stuff and so without even really like thinking consciously about it like when reels and Instagram started becoming a thing, um, this all like honestly kind of translated just very seamlessly. And my growth on Instagram happened really organically. And so it all kind of like meshed together because so I was at the Naval Academy Prep School during COVID. And oh, which, you know, everyone has their own you know, horrible COVID stories, but like these kids, these students, these 18, 19, 20 year olds separated from their families for the first time. We're trying to like indoctrinate them into the Navy, like during COVID, literally like they're, they couldn't leave base for a whole year. They didn't have any sport. Like it was very miserable for them. And 
Instagram, like I, at that time, I started to just like kind of test posting things about leadership and about my experience and trying to like see if that would be something that was how it was received. And it started to like kind of pick up. And then my students one day were like, ma'am, you should post a reel. <laughs> and I was like, what's a reel? I don't even know what that is. And they're like, oh my gosh, we'll teach you. And then they're like, we should make this. And they were like showing me, you know, like the little trending whatever videos. And so that literally became our like COVID activity that I would be like, okay, like this is the video we're going to make today, everyone, like get in formation. And they would be taken from such like low lows <laughs> and they would be leaving smiling laughing happy and like no one sees that and no one like knows that story of like really how I got started on Instagram but it really started because I was trying to just like pick them up from them being so sad mm -hmm. about their circumstances and I felt and honestly like during that time I was all that they really had, but they were also really all that I had. Like I couldn't, you know, we couldn't go to grocery stores. We couldn't be doing anything. So like I basically lived at work during that time. And then because of the videos that we were making, they started like catching on, you know, and getting popular and going viral or whatever. And so that is how my following grew. And then from there, I was like learning just more about, and I'm also an IT major from the Naval Academy. Mm -hmm. So my like sciencey brain it's so funny. It's like this art and science of that whole space. So like the art part, you know, making videos and editing them or coming up with the ideas and whatever. But then my science brain is like, okay, there's an algorithm that we have to like play with here. And there's like, you know, timing of when we post and what does well and what, you know, whatever. Um, and so then from there, it I started getting questions from random people. And I remember my first question was like, um, hey, ma'am, like, what was your experience at OCS like? And I remember saying back to him, I was like, oh, I didn't go to OCS. I went to the Naval Academy, so I don't have that experience. But I would love to help you find somebody. Like, I'm sure someone that follows me went to OCS. And so my very first post ever on my story was like, does anyone want to talk to this person about OCS? Like, they're looking for someone to mentor them about it. And I had like 10 people in one day be like, me, me, like, that's me, that's me, that's me. And so I was like, hey, here's 10 people that would love to talk to you. And so, like, the next week, I got questions about, like, Navy supply. And I was like, well, I really can't talk about that. So did the same thing. And so then I was like, hmm, okay, what if I just say, hey, who needs help? Who wants a mentor? And I consolidate all these requests. And then each week, I will post them and see who responds. And as soon as I did that, I have not not posted a mentor request in three years. And now, to date... I think we're over around like 2,300 mentor, mentee connections just from social media. So I have to like, you know, I tried to turn my platform into good because otherwise it was kind of like directionless and self-serving. But now it's like every single thing I post, it's like means something to someone, whether it's about like female empowerment or just like leadership in general or mentorship. Like I really feel like I've tried to really narrow down my message, but then also using my like fun creative side to like make content. So it's actually mm -hmm. like so fun and interesting and I still am figuring it out. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the long story about yeah that. And that's all, of course, outside of work. Like that's right. not my, <laughs> that's not my real job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so you started to kind of touch on this, but talk about your nonprofit that is working on mentorship matches in the military. Yes. So this whole thing over Instagram and social media, um, I got to a point last year where I was like, oh my gosh, I am inundated <laughs> with requests because I would get messages that were like, my OIC told me to contact you to get a mentor. Like my sergeant told me to contact you. So like, this is like gaining legitimacy amongst like all levels, you know, and we're, we help people of all branches, um, all ranks. We help people who are, you know, in high school that are interested in service. Like I've never turned a request down. I've gotten spouses, you know, that want to connect with other spouses. So I remember looking at my request. And I was like, I have over 200 unmet requests. Like I need help. And so – one time I posted like an SOS on my story where I was like, 
my first idea was like, I need a website to help automate this. Because right now, and I'm still, I have a team now, but we're doing everything by hand. Mm -hmm. Everything through my DMs, everything through an email that I'm like hand typing. I have like, my whole program is a big Google Doc, (laughs) like that has every single mentor that's ever responded. So I like, I'm terrified of like, having that deleted, I keep like saving it because I'm like, oh my God, if this disappears, like I'm done for. (laughs) Um, And I just was like, hey, if anyone knows anything about like websites, well, let me know. And interestingly, and this is like, I don't know, like I'm one of the miracles in my life, I feel, where things just kind of like fall on your lap and you don't even realize it's like a miracle in your life. But I had someone DM me back and they were like, hey, Jackie, if no one gets back to you on this, like, shout out to me like let me know and no one else had responded and this person was a student of mine that I had at naps during COVID like Mm -hmm. when I like you know tried to take care of all these kids and I will never forget you know because I and I feel bad because he's like he has a full-time job and he's just like offering to help and I remember being like I will compensate you at some point. I can't right now. Like, you know, we're a startup. We're, I'm a, like, non- I hadn't even filed the non-profit, the non-profit idea. I hadn't entered my mind at that point yet. I just mm-hmm. was like, I will pay you somehow at some point. And he was like, no, like absolutely not. Like the way that you treated our son and took care of all those NAPS kids, like this is on us, like us being all the NAPS parents. You know what I mean? And I just was like, and he still, that was eight months ago. And he just sent me today, actually, some like um, like screen recordings because he's been working on the, you know, back end stuff. And, we you know, since then, we've hired on a uh, designer to make the website. Pre- you know, we've grown the team since then. But he was like the very per- first person that was like, I believe in you and I believe in what you're doing. And like, I'm I'm offering help with nothing. I don't want anything in return. Um, and so I like it's just really humbling to Mm -hmm. have people that like without even knowing really like what the vision is and where you know they're like yep I'm in like I'm here for it yep and so that was in October of last year so then when I'm like okay this is growing faster than I can keep up with like that's when I was like okay I want to like legitimize this give it an actual name um because before it was just like my my own name associated to it um and so in December is when I finally like went through the the paper like you know the horrible paperwork side of it um because I was like you know what this is a gap in the military that I am trying to fill and I want like I can see it I'm trying to manifest it but I see it as like a resource that is something that's kind of just like a well-known thing like hiring our heroes or like military ones where it's like there, there are these resources in the military that we like know of because we recognize them like I want mentors and service to be one of those like if you want to find a mentor outside your chain of command no matter what the topic is it could be personal professional whatever like we will do everything that we can to help find somebody for you how do you find somebody so um when we get a request so right now we get requests through like a google form um it's all set still so eventually when we get like the the platform working we're still working on that um it'll be through a website and probably integrated with social media in some way. But right now, um, people every week will fill out this little Google form, and it just has, like, their name, content information, and then a description of who they're looking for. And we get, like, the gambit of, like, there's such interesting ones where someone's like, I, like, sprained my ankle, and I, like, am having physical therapy done. I want to talk to somebody else who's, like, had that same injury. And I'm like, (laughs) no way we're going to find someone who – and look, boom – like, we get, like, five responses, um, and it's all through my stories. So I post it on my Instagram stories, and then mentors or, like, whoever has gone or been through that um, will respond and be like, hey, that's me. This is my name and content information. So that's why I feel like it's successful because it's not, like, um, this very, like, broad, like, I'm going to mentor you about leadership in general. <laughs> it's, like, very, like, I get a lot of I'm enlisted and I want to commission. And I have, like, 15 people who have signed up to be mentored on that specific topic. Mm-hmm. Um, or, like, I want to talk to somebody about being a single father in the military, you know. And I think that it works well when someone is saying, like, I want this, I have this specific goal or I have this specific need. 
and someone is like, oh, yeah, I identify with that. Like, I can help you with that specific thing. That's so right now, yeah. And then they respond. And then I literally, like, by hand, put them in my little Google sheet <laughs> and then send an email where I'm like, hey, here are all the people. And I will, like, no matter how many responses I get, like, some emails, I'll be like, here are 20 people. Like, I will give you all the names. Because another thing, like, I – it's kind of like therapy. Like, you're not – guaranteed to like click with your therapist the first person you get assigned or whatever so I'm like hey here's like two three people like hopefully one is good Mm -hmm. you know so that's the goal and kind of how it how it works right now so awesome and I love the specifics too like you said because you know you could have a professional need and be surrounded by people at, at work that are doing what you're doing but um maybe you don't feel comfortable talking about it maybe mm-hmm. it's just something that's specific to you um, for listeners out there that have a cause that they want to get behind and they want to move to that 501c3 nonprofit status, what advice would you give for building a team, garnering resources aside from the one that you said fell into your lap? Um, but obviously you worked for that one too, but just advice on getting started when you have an idea, but you really don't know where to start. Um, right when you start doing the paperwork side, it's very overwhelming. And there's so many like legal Zoom or like organs, like businesses that were like, we'll make it easy for you. But like, I feel like if you are owning something and starting something, like you need to be the one to understand through and through every single piece of paper that you're filing, every single thing that you're doing. Like, I just got had like I started with like one of those organizations and then it led to like oh but we also do this and this and this and then soon I'm like oh my gosh I'm paying like two thousand dollars out of pocket when I'm like okay if I do it myself it costs you know way way less just like filing fees Mm -hmm. and I'm actually understanding the process and it's like painful but it's like that good pain where you're like oof like this is rough to get through but like I feel like I really earn that tax exemption, like determination (laughs) letter, like I did all the work behind it. Um, So definitely like walk through every single step and then also like getting mentors for it, like other people that are subject matter experts uh, with nonprofits. Like I was lucky enough to be connected to like an accountant who specializes in nonprofit stuff and like a professor at University of San Diego who like teaches a nonprofit stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this is so definitely surrounding yourself with people who have gone through it and gone through it recently too, because like it's a very slow process in terms of like <laughs> getting funding. Like it doesn't, it's a very competitive space I'm learning. Like it's a nonprofit, but it's still a business at the end of the day. And when you're applying for grants, like, you know, the veteran nonprofit space is like, they're all we're all competing for the same money. Um, so trying to like, you know, be collaborative with those other organizations and just trying to learn from them and be like, hey, I want to help you. Like, can you help me? And just trying to forge those relationships through, yeah, mentorship, other people that have done it, other people that want to help. Um, all those sort of resources have have helped. And then even my team that I have now, because I have so many people responding to messages where I'm like, I need someone to literally be me in my DMs. So I, again, like sent out like the SOS. I'm like, I need someone to do this, these three things. And boom, like people volunteering to help. And so like you, you're, what's the saying? Like you miss the shots you don't take. It's like the worst you could say is just put it out there. Like the worst that could happen is either no one responds. That's really it, the worst. Um, So just keep asking for help. And that's something that, doesn't even like really come naturally to me. And I feel like people in the military in general were like, oh, I'll figure it out on my own. But like you, with most things, like you shouldn't. Like there's plenty of other organizations that started from an idea or something that just kind of organically, like, you know, they recognized a gap and then wanted to fill it. So asking for help. Absolutely. I love that. Um, I think I love that for you, social media turned into something super positive. Um getting a following, talking about leadership topics and talking about things that maybe weren't being discussed in the military space and then turning it into this organization that was doing such great things. Can you talk about 
what you've witnessed with some of the negative effects of social media or times where it may be draining when you're trying to brand something or trying to be involved in that space, but it can be difficult at times. And there's obviously a correlation between mental health and social media usage. And so do you have any experience with that that you would want to share? Yes. Um, It's this like crazy, like dichotomy where on one hand, it's like very polarizing in the first place. Like social media in general Mm -hmm. is like, just either you are like a believer or like you think no one should like you think it's horrible add like the military aspect onto that add the female aspect onto that like it just becomes even more and more polarizing so last weekend i was literally like not even a few days ago on saturday i was volunteering at the flight line 5k on miramar and this girl who was running, like, came up to me. And I would have never known who she was. And she came up to me and she was like, hey, ma'am, like, I just want to let you know you provided me with two mentors um, and I'm going to OCS soon. And I was, like, elated. I'm like, that literally is the absolute, like, most amazing example of, like, why I do the things that I do in my mentor program. Like, that is the perfect example. Like, she would have run right by me. I would have never have known. Um, I've had that happen a few times where, like, strangers will approach me and be like, I follow you. Know, I, you know, that I follow you. It happens all the time. The gate guards are like, oh, my God, I love your videos. Um, <laughs> and so it's, like, such the happy, positive side. So literally the day after I woke up, and, you know, we're humans. Like, I can't help but look at my comments. Like, I wish I was able to not, but I can't help it. And I got this comment, and it was from a woman, which just stings more. Like, I'm pretty unaffected by men's comments at this point because um, I just have convinced, you know, told myself that men are not good at expressing their feelings and, like, they don't mean it personally and, like, I'm glad that they are expressing themselves, even though I don't think it's the healthiest thing for them to do on social media. Like, you know, I just have, like, have that story in my brain. But, like, I don't have a story like that for, like, for women, for whatever reason. I just am one of those, like, all women should support women kind of person. And so when a woman is, like, attacking me, I just take it, like, a huge punch in the gut. So basically I get this comment that's, like, we are all – we – I don't know who we is. I guess all women on the globe. We are begging you to stop posting on social media. Um, Like, stop speaking for us. Um, Like, you are not helping. Like, like, just so mean. Just, like, really mean. And it, like, took someone so much time to write that out, too. And I just was like, oh, my gosh, okay? And I didn't even realize this, but I spent – until Monday. I spent the entire rest of that day – sitting in the dark in my living room, like didn't even like leave my house all day. And then on Monday, I was like, I was depressed yesterday. Like, that's not me. I don't like sit in the dark all day, you know? And so that's like the negative side. Um, One of the negative sides, like there's other negative sides, but like it's the, when someone's like, you're not helping, you're actually like hurting Hurt. I don't know what I'm, who I'm hurting. I'm people like respond to me, like I'm out here actively like hurting people. When I have, but then it's like, and I get, you know, I shouldn't even do this, and I like wish I doesn't I need to work on for sure. But it's like you get sucked into that one hateful comment when I should have just been like, someone literally approached me yesterday with like life altering news in a positive way. Like I wish I just could focus on that more, but like inevitably like we're humans and I can't but um so that's that and then people like weaponizing the like complaint system like I've had three complaints filed against me you know which is really unpleasant having your rights read to you when you know you're not doing anything wrong like I know the policies forwards and backwards you know people just get like so emotional and think that's like and they're all anonymous of course you know so that's a negative, um, I've written like a point paper about this, like, um, because it is like such a powerful tool, but people need to understand that, yeah, like there is a very dark, bad side to it. 
Um, I don't post anything of like my family because in the past, like somehow someone's gotten like my parents' phone numbers and has like called my parents and you know, there's like so many scammers and like that gets really sad when people are like, are you talking to my disabled brother? Like he thinks that you're getting married. Like, I'm like, no, it's not me. Like, I'm so sorry. That's how, you know, so that's like heartbreaking, those kinds of things that I just can't control. Um, so it's like, do those things outweigh the good? Like, no, not yet. And I am, you know, in my thirties. So mentally like I've at least developed some mental resilience where I can kind of get over these things pretty quickly but I really worry about our young service members who are already like I started my mind started growing when I was already like a captain um so I do worry about like our younger service members who are lower ranking who are on social media and like the hate they face because I do think it's kind of different um so yeah there's definitely that ugly side that I think the bad side of human human nature I guess Mm -hmm. and I think that the point is that anytime you do something there's going to be naysayers or there's going to be people that have something to say about it and unfortunately it's often the people that aren't really contributing much of anything or putting action to the things that they believe about so for anybody listening that may be starting something um, be it media be it you know, a nonprofit, whatever it is, and they're being faced with opposition or criticism or just honestly hate. Um, What advice would you give to kind of, you know, peacefully acknowledge and then just believe in yourself and kind of keep moving past and focusing on what you're focusing on? I would say, well, the first thing that's important for anyone kind of entering that space is like, you really need to know what the rules are because there are very, like, black and white policies with what you can and can't do. Like, you can't be endorsing politicians or, like, making statements about policies in uniform. You can't be endorsing products in uniform. You know, there's, like, things that you can't do that will, like, immediately get you, like, in legal trouble. Um, But with, like, the hate, I just think it's so important to have a support system. And honestly, having people that kind of, check your sanity and remind you like what you're doing is important and like you know my poor mom has like repeated her same little spiel to me because I'll be like oh this happened this comment was made and it like upset me and she's like so patient and no matter what she's never been like get over it like this is what you asked for it's what you signed up for you know it's like this is your purpose like you are making a difference like think about xyz person that has thanked you and like okay yes 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 so like having those people in your life to ground you you have to be surrounded by people that can pick you back up after those kind of low moments absolutely um shifting gears a little bit can you tell us uh why you're in the dc area this week and a little bit more of a positive note what you're here uh doing and participating in yes oh my gosh my favorite (laughs) time of the year okay i'm at the Joint Women's Leadership Symposium, and it is taking place in Arlington this year. Two years ago, it was in Norfolk, I think. Last year, it was in San Diego. There's a rumor that they're going to just have it be on the East Coast forever now going forward, um, which is fine. I like coming to D.C. And it is literally, I look forward to it every year. It is a two-day conference, and it is for all the services. And every single year, it gets bigger and bigger. I think today... With the like the welcome or opening ceremonies, there was like a thousand service members, and they're like pretty much all women, maybe like five men, and it is so positive. Everyone in that room is like a believer in supporting each other, and it's like literally like Disneyland and summer camp combined. And we had like the CNO speak today. We have panels that address. Um, and all these, all kinds of topics that are mostly related to being a woman in the military uh, because we have very specific issues because I just love when men are like, where's the men's symposium? I'm like, my response is always like, name one male specific problem mm-hmm. or issue. Like, you're welcome to come hear about our issues that actually would, would I would appreciate that because you could learn and get from our perspective. Um, but yeah, so Jules is just like, 
so amazing. And it's such a good opportunity for networking and people to learn and listen. And like I got to be a speaker today for a panel um, about excellence in and out of uniform. So I got to speak about my nonprofit a lot. Um, so yeah, it's so amazing. So any female service members and males, but like, but particularly females, I really recommend going. This is my at least fifth year that I've attended. Like I really intend to go every single year possible because it's so great. Awesome. What have been some of your favorite uh, talks that you heard about? Um, I mean, the CNO speech today was so awesome. She gave us like her top seven sort of like lessons learned of leadership. So that was amazing. Um, we had this super interesting um, panel about inclusion and the difference between like integration and inclusion. And like we had this professor who's like a professor at Harvard talking and she was just like so, you know, people are like so smart and just like rattle off statistics and studies. And she was like one of those people where she was like, this study has shown this and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and she was talking about like have the importance of having male allies and the men to be the one to speak up for women. Because it's always us being like the villain or the, you know, you know what, having to call everybody out and stand up for ourselves and trying to change the culture to like having men be the ones to stand up for us. And it means so much more and it's really effective. So that panel was so awesome today. Um, so, yeah. That's awesome. And if anybody's interested in attending, is there a special process to apply? So each branch does it differently, I think, um, because headquarters for the Marine Corps, the Marine Corps will fund however many seats. I forget. So it's kind of like you email someone, you're like, I want to go. And they're like, okay, gotcha. Got great, great, great. And then you can register through their website. Um, so I'm pretty sure on the website, which is through the C Services SSLA, Sea Services Leadership Association, on their website, they will have the dates for next year. And then they'll have links to each branch of like kind of how you get funded, get registered and stuff like that. So definitely go to that website. And also their Instagram is pretty, very helpful as well. So um, this, it's called like Sea Services Lead is their Instagram account. Okay, awesome. Um Switching gears to more a more of a personal question, but often we hear it takes a village to do all the things that, you know, we need to do. And you obviously are juggling your career on active duty, getting this nonprofit started, being super involved in your community, getting behind a lot of initiatives. So who is in your village right now uh, helping you do all the amazing things that you're doing? I think it depends on, like, the... Like, I think I, I feel like I have different villages other than like my family who are just like probably rolling their eyes all the time because I'm just like, oh, I'm also going to do this thing. And they're like, when? And like, I'm getting my master's right now. My mom's like, what? Where are you? OK. You know, so they're sick of me. But um, like another passion project that I have is um, trying to be like an advocate for family planning and like, ha you know, pushing for. Um, TRICARE to cover fertility treatment and like, you know, egg freezing for service members. Like that's because I personally had to go through that, didn't have any of it covered. It was a horrible experience, like navigating the military health system and all that. Um, and so through that, I have like a family advocacy group of like 40 people that I form from that who are all also interested in that. And there's like through that I met someone who's a pilot who also is like was on the news talking about this and she's like a huge advocate and she's done a ton of research and like every time like she or I make some sort of move or like read some discovery we like send it back and forth to each other because like we both just like feel very strongly about this issue. Um, so that's like someone in that village and that whole little group of people that I know I can kind of reach out to and everyone's like yeah grab our torches and pitchforks like yes we're all motivated about this thing um I even so I am a coach at a gym and like I have that community of people and those are all no one in the military and that's like a whole different perspective of people and they have different backgrounds and experiences and um they care about like fitness and you know, mental health and all those things. So I have like that village that really supports me. Um, and then like my team for my nonprofit. So it's kind of like 
I have these different Camps. groups that I can <laughs> lean against uh, depending on like what I need or like what I'm focusing on. That's awesome. Yeah, they're they're like little camps from different parts of your life. Mm -hmm. um, interested to hear more about um, advocacy and family planning and what that's looked like from a support side and maybe even an opposition side because that's definitely a uh, very much talked about topic right now um, for for service members. So interested to hear more about that. So for me. I, okay, so for anyone that has, like, TRICARE, I was turning, this when I was in Rhode Island, so I think I was, like, turning 30 or 29, and um, I wanted to just know, I just wanted to, like, have a baseline and be like, what do, what do my egg count, what does it look like? Because, you know, when women are born, we have a certain amount of eggs, and that is all we are born with, unlike men who just can just <laughs> make more sperm every five seconds you know an unlimited amount we have like a limited amount so i just was like hmm let me i'm just curious because i do want to have kids in the future at some point so if you have tricare you can ask for an amh test which is a simple blood test and they will it's like they give you basically a number and it's like on a scale and um it can kind of tell you what's in your like ovarian reserve and like disclaimer i'm not a doctor so I'm just putting that out there. Probably some doctor listening being like, that is incorrect. <laughs> but this is what I remember. And so between the age of like 29, so I did when I was 29 and I did it again when I was 30. And my number like significantly dropped. It like dropped below like the normal threshold. And at that point, I had just started dating someone, like wasn't engaged. And I was like, you know, I know I want to have kids, but I want to like preserve my ability to have kids. So I started going down the, you know, trying to get information about egg freezing, come to find out TRICARE doesn't cover anything at all. I get referred out in town. Um, I should have gotten, been able to go to a military hospital, but they didn't have a doctor there because they were retiring. So I just got like ping ponged around. And basically the, the option to use a military hospital was like not even an option for me. So that would have been like way, like a third of the cost. So anyway, I had to go out in town, um, got my eggs frozen one time. I only like, it was a low number that I got. The doctor was like, uh, you have like a very low percentage of even like having one live birth from this number, whatever. So I had to do it again, I had to do it two times out of pocket, which is like already was a lot for me. It was like over 20, it was like $20,000. So can you like, I don't, it's just like so much to ask of service members. So I was already like stressed out about having like low numbers and, and you know, I'm stressed about spending the money. I was like, I can't feasibly do this again. And I was like, why aren't we allowing women to have this option? Like, if you are a part-time employee at Starbucks, your health care will cover for this for you, for you to just preserve your ability to have kids. Um, and so it just seems like a no-brainer, but for it's, of course, very complicated. And what's frustrating is that in 2016, there was a... It was called the Force of the Future. It was like a pilot program where $56 million were allocated and approved by Congress to for this, like for egg freezing and sperm freezing for service members. And within one year, by 2017, the program was canceled. So some like, I think it was like, I forget who the Secretary of Defense was at the time, like had the wherewithal literally after going to like Silicon Valley and being like, oh, all these like companies provide this healthcare benefit to their employees because we're trying to retain the women like let's do that and then it um, pff, didn't even get off the ground um so i'm like there's been research about this there's been like so many focus groups i've been in where the where the women are like if we have this benefit like i will stay in um and so i'm just kind of a huge advocate for just any any conversation i like try to bring it up and there's anyone important in a room i'm like let's talk about egg freezing for service members, for women. Like this will really help with retention. Um, so I've written like point papers and then I like I'm connected with people who have done, um, do like presentations and just trying to get information out there. Cause there's also a big just lack of information about it. Like women don't even know where to start. If they're even interested in that process, it's really hard to navigate the military healthcare system. Cause you know, like each doctor will say something different or thinks, you know, thinks it's just, 
unnecessarily complicated on something that's already stressful and a burden financially. So I just care a lot about trying to make some sort of change happen in that arena. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, switching gears to just who you are as a person, um, how do you like to spend your days when you're trying to balance time for you and not be contributing to some of the other things that we've talked about? I'm bad at that. Um, <laughs> I pretty much like will do my job at work. Sometimes I go coach workout classes and I go to another work and then I come home and do work until bedtime. Um, but for me, honestly, like the nonprofit stuff is not like work. I don't think of it as work. You mm -hmm. know, it's something that I enjoy doing. Um, but I do like I have set things in place to kind of protect me from being like pinged all the time. Like I don't have any notifications on my phone turned on except texts and calls. So I'm not getting like constant my phone lighting up because that's like super distracting to me. So I like have turned all that kind of stuff off. I'm trying to implement like no tech times. So like, like I will only work on my nonprofit, like, or go through my DMs and go through all the mentor responses, like once or twice a week, not every single day. Um, so I'll do like four hours and at once instead of like one hour a day, you know? Um, and I mean, for me, like recharging my battery really like consists of me just like vegging on the couch <laughs> because I, I am so like go, 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 go. Yeah. So any moment that I can be like, oh, I'm not traveling this weekend. Yes. Like I'm going to do literally nothing or go to the pool like that is boring but like that's what i need yeah you know like the, the weekends where i don't have anything planned i get so happy because every week like in the month of may i was booked and traveling every single weekend um so i remember after i was like wow i am exhausted that was all fulfilling and great but now i want to literally do nothing because my battery <laughs> is like i'm running on fumes yep well, I definitely understand that, and I appreciate you turning back around and, and being here. Um, well, tell us what's next for you, Marine Corps-wise. Where do you think you're headed next, and um, what does the future look like? I wish I knew, girl. Like, <laughs> I am up for orders next year. So I will be on a bunch of boards. So I'll have to let you know because <laughs> I don't know what's next. It's so – I'm at this, like, another inflection point where – you know, like Marine Corps will send me where they want to send me, like whether I want to or not. And so if that's somewhere that I'm really not wanting to go, like, I, I don't know. Like, I've never been sure or I've never been one of those like, I'm in for life. Like, I'm staying in for 20. I thought didn't think I would even be in this long. Mm -hmm. So I would love to be involved in like recruiting because I just think my skill set particularly like I'm very organized and like I can communicate well with that age group like I've already proved like social media thing like so I'd like to go in that direction maybe we're going to manifest that here and we'll this <laughs> might age well or badly yeah um but honestly I don't I don't know I just care a lot about like the people the organization I'm learning like I'm a logistics officer normally but it doesn't keep me up at night mm -hmm. it's like the people that keep me up at night and the policies and like things that I want that we can make better mm -hmm. for like the next generation. It gets everything we do is for the next generation in my mind. Um, so we will see. Awesome. I, I will report that. back on that. And I think keeping an open mind is the most important thing because then you're open to all the opportunities that come up. Mm -hmm. um, so for a closing question, who is your woman in the arena? Who is a woman that inspires you to just chase after all the dreams, wild ideas, be it service academy, starting, you know, an organization on your own, advocating for what you believe in, who would be your woman that's inspired you in your life? The first person that comes to my mind is my mom, just because, like, she's never once been like, oh, I think that's a bad idea. Like, that's not going to end up well. Or, you know, like, she's just always pushed me to, like, 
yeah, go try it. Like you can do it. Whatever you put your mind to, like you got to figure it out on your own. But like, I'm here to catch you if you like fail and we'll, we'll figure it out, you know, but she's like the first person that comes to my mind. Um, and she's just been that way, like my whole life with everything. And that's, she has, I don't know. She like has the ability to make me like really believe like in me. Mm-hmm. when I feel like a lot when I'm getting attacked from all these different angles like she reminds me like hey these are all the things that you've done like who cares about these people like you're making a difference you know and so I would say her I love that um we've got a lot of fierce moms supporting the guests on our podcast Aww. and it's always good to hear that do you have any uh famous girl crushes that you could cite since mom's been there since day one um, well, I mean, I'm at the CNO today and I almost like passed out. So Tell us what CNO stands for. The for Chief of Naval know. Operations, the <laughs> first female Chief of Naval Operations. I'm going to say her name wrong. Admiral Franchet, Fran, Franchetti, right? I think that's right. I said a ch or a k. I'm like, you know, when you're Italian, you like <laughs> pronounce things differently. I think it's Franchetti. Um, I breathed the same air as her today, and I felt not worthy of that. Um, (laughs) She's just, like, so smart and capable and competent and sweet. And, like, in her speech today, she was talking about her role, like, her different roles. And it's, like, so amazing because I just feel like it's rare if a man is talking about their roles. Like, it's rare that they're, like, my role is a husband and a father. Like, it doesn't, like, come up as often like you definitely hear it but it's like she was just like specifically talking about like her role like in all the aspects and mm-hmm. it was like so refreshing she's talking about like being the chief of naval, naval operations and like balancing her mental she's like specifically talked about mental health and like physical health and like her family and it's just like all these things that we all relate to but she was like presenting it and she's like so high up there to the highest ranking person in the navy you know and just like talking about all these like very normal topics that every single person can like relate to and learn from so she's like just so smart yes and you breathe the same air as her breathe the same air (laughs) should have put in a bottle (laughs) awesome well jackie thank you so much for being here tonight and we hope that you have a great rest of your trip in dc and continue to breathe the air of fellow amazing women um we do have a little gift for you this is your woman in the arena oh my god um, bracelet <gasps> yes <laughs> I'm not right now absolutely oh my gosh this um, is too cute it has a quote from our podcast which is obviously from the man in the arena speech but we've changed it to the woman in the arena and we hope that all of our guests including you can wear it with um pride and all the amazing things you're doing and look down at it when there's critics or naysayers or people that have something to say and just know that you're doing the work and you're putting your ideas into action and you always have a crew of people here at Iron Butterfly Media cheering you on. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was going to, like, open this right now, but it was all getting crinkly sounding. So I won't do it right now, but I am so just happy. Best day ever. So nice meeting you. So you're nice meeting you, so too. So sweet. So nice meeting you, too. We're so glad you could be here and – Thanks so much for contributing and call to action from this uh, episode is to uh, get connected to mentors in service. And if you're looking for a mentor or if you have a a soldier, airman, sailor, marine that is in need of mentorship for whatever reason to reach out and get matched with someone. So thanks so much for explaining that process. I know that we're going to continue matching lots of people through this connection. So awesome. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you. The Women in the Arena podcast is powered by Iron Butterfly Media, a production company committed to honoring the lives of women who have had an unseen and outsized impact on our world. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you have a woman who you would like to nominate as a guest, please shoot us a message on our social media platforms. Be sure to subscribe and follow on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. See you next time.